My name is Matthew Arrett, and I am the co-creator with my wife Cynthia Chung of the new film series The Hidden Hand Behind UFOs, which you are about to watch. Before you start this first episode, we thought that it were important that a few words be said about why we decided to make this film series and what you should expect. We know that government and secrecy have gone hand in hand since time immemorial, and whether it involves the murder of presidents, the orchestration of wars, or the promotion of colonial enslavement of entire peoples, such darkness can only occur through the veil of secrecy. But now suddenly we are led to believe that this rule of secrecy in government has completely broken down in the strangest of places. Specifically in the domain of extraterrestrial contact, secrecy no longer seems to matter at all, but rather the opposite. Across all mainstream media channels, we have heard repeated tales of UFO whistleblowers demanding disclosure of alien contact with governments. Major government institutions like the Pentagon, the Congress, the Air Force, and NASA have promoted highly publicized inquiries into aliens, and leading elected officials seem to speak more freely about aliens than about the real geopolitical agendas driving the wars in the Middle East, or the loss of sovereignty to a financier oligarchy that has become more powerful than nation-states. We should be talking about and solving these existential problems threatening all of humanity right now, but instead extremely powerful forces seem to want us to think a lot about aliens. So what's really going on? In the following film series, we will tackle the deep and subtle roots of the UFO disclosure movement from the earliest days of the Cold War to the present. We will review the role of such figures as H.G. Wells, Alan Dulles, Lawrence Rockefeller, and even Carl Jung in influencing this movement, and we will examine the origins of flying saucers both during and after World War II. But in order to really get at the heart of why this is all happening at this moment in history, the first episode of our series will begin much further back in time as we review the pre-Christian world shaped as it was by pagan mystery religions managed by priesthoods of initiates. We will do this in order to better appreciate how those occult mystery religions did not disappear with the rise of Christianity as so many of us have been told, but merely went underground. This occult underground has continued throughout the centuries, operating in the shadows, orchestrating wars, coups, assassinations, and cultural warfare leading up to the British Empire's Hellfire Club and the Society for Psychical Research of the 18th and 19th centuries. By establishing a direct connection between the ancient world and the modern era's imperial intrigues tied to such things as Rosicrucianism, Kabbalism, Theosophy, and Freemasonic cults, it will become clear how the rebranding of ancient pagan priesthoods has unfolded into our modern times. Although it may not seem obvious at first, this exercise will be most important to understand how the UFO mythos emerged in the 20th century and the true purpose behind the revival of ancient pagan cults under a great reset today. Perennial why has shadowed human history since the first sharp realization of our own mortality. This question has never failed to spark a search for understanding, which in turn has left in its wake various myths, rites, and representations of the divine. According to the ancient writings of Hesiod in his Theogony, in the beginning there existed only chaos. Once arose Gaia and Eros, 
Then Gaia bore a being equal to herself, able to cover her entirely, starry Uranus. Gaia, with Uranus as her partner, would give birth to the twelve Titans, the first generation of Titans, six male and six female. Of these, Kronos partnered with his older sister Rhea, who then bore the first generation of Olympians, Zeus, Hades, Poseidon, Hestia, Demeter, and Hera. As the story is told by Hesiod, Uranus hated his children, the Twelve Titans, and Gaia asked that her children rebel. Kronos is the only one to answer her call, and Uranus, drunken to penetrate the body of the earth, was castrated by Kronos with a sickle. From the blood that flowed upon Gaia, there came into the world the three Irines, goddesses of vengeance, the giants, and the nymphs of ash trees. From the sexual organs of Uranus thrown into the sea, Aphrodite was born. This archaic myth represents the violent separation between heaven and earth. It is a myth that has been widely disseminated and documented in various cultures, including Egypt and India. In all likelihood, Hesiod knew these oriental traditions. His theogony centered around the conflict between the divine generations and the struggle for universal sovereignty. Such origin myths, also known as creation myths, would serve as the foundation for the earliest cults. A cult, strictly speaking, is a particular system of religious worship, especially with reference to its rites and ceremonies. Etymologically, the word cult comes from the root of the word culture, representing the core system of beliefs and activities at the basis of a culture. Thus, every human being belongs to a cult in its most general sense, because everyone belongs to a culture. The literal and traditional meaning of the word cult is derived from the Latin cultus, meaning care or adoration. Apollo, also known as the god of the sun and of the light, was also god of archery, music, dance, truth and prophecy, healing and disease, poetry and more. The cult of Delphi was the most prominent and influential cult in ancient Greece and had its roots in the cult of Marduk based in Babylon and the cult of Horus based in Egypt. In the cult of Delphi, a priestess, who it was said was intoxicated by the gas vapors of the chasm, would be the intermediary messenger who would deliver the words of the gods in indecipherable gibberish, to which the priests of Delphi would translate for those asking for prophecy. It is said that no large political decision was ever made in Greece, most notably in Athens and Sparta, without first consulting the oracle at Delphi. In Egypt, it was the pharaoh who acted as the obligatory intermediary between the gods and humans. The hierarchical priesthood overseeing the Egyptian cult of the pharaoh's pantheon of gods, as well as the rites of initiation, was at the heart of the growth of many of the secret societies across thousands of years. The Egyptian god equivalent to Apollo was Horus. Horus, the god of kingship, healing, protection, and the sun and sky, represented the kingship itself and was seen as a protector of the pharaoh. In Babylon, the Apollo equivalent is Marduk, whose name means calf of the sun, and thus is the son of the sun. Like the cult of Apollo at Delphi and the cult of Horus in Egypt, no king of Babylon would decide on making war or peace without first consulting the oracle of the Marduk priesthood. It is thought that the temples of Apollo, Horus, and Marduk were linked under a common network and thus controlled all intelligence and decisions for war and peace between these nodes. The priests effectively operated above all else, with no specific loyalty towards the kings they were advising and the welfare of their people. These mystery cults or mystery religions would continue to play a central role within Rome, Byzantium, and later empires, and continue in their influences to this day. The mystery cults take the form of three main branches, the Mithraic, the Orphic Apollonian, and the Dionysian Mysteries. 
Thus, the mystery cults, which reserved their secret knowledge for initiates who would seek wisdom and power through esoteric practices and rituals, generally interpreted their scriptures allegorically to reveal so-called hidden spiritual truths that were usually known only to the higher-ranking initiates of the religion. This is what has made up the hidden hand behind the political decisions and spiritual beliefs of the day for millennia. What exactly is the occult? Etymologically, the word means that which is covered or hidden and is used in reference to knowledge of the hidden. By the time of the 16th century, the term occult sciences emerged and was used to reference astrology, alchemy, and natural magic. In the 19th century, the French occult revival involved a rediscovery and popularization of alchemy, magic, and the Kabbalah. Its progenitor was Eliphas Levy, pseudonym of Alphonse Louis Constant, a defrocked priest but lifelong Catholic. Levy's work would influence many other prominent occultists, including symbolist writers like Baudelaire, the painters of Salon de la Rose Croix, Gustave Moreau, the English Pre Raphaelites, the scandalous poet Algernon Charles Swinburne, and the Russian decadents. Famed British occult writer Edward Bulwer Lytton, a Rosicrucian, put Levy and his philosophy into his popular novels. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, whose members included the theosophically inclined Irish poet William Butler Yeats and the scholar A. E. Wade, attempted to synthesize the vast and bewildering body of occult material into a system using Eliphas Levy's works as its foundation. Even Helena Blavatsky leaned heavily on Levy's work for her own theosophical system. A cult revival of the 19th century occurred in tandem with the advent of the spiritualism fad, which was a creation of the Fox sisters. Spiritualism, as the doctrine and the movement, not the general search for the spiritual, was the affirmation of the continued existence of the dead and the ability of the living to communicate with them through specifically gifted mediums. The Fox sisters came from the Burned Over District, a poor farming region that got its name because it was seared so many times by the fires of religious enthusiasm. Social unrest and economic instability created a state of mind susceptible to intense religious emotions. Enthusiastic sects flourished in this area, which was also the birthplace of Mormonism. According to his own testimony, in 1820, amidst the fervor of the Great Awakening, Joseph Smith was visited by two beings, Jesus and his father. These two beings appeared in flesh and blood, and gave him a divine message that he was chosen to create a new church for select initiates of a new religion, which was to be called the Mormon Church of Latter-day Saints. Smith was told that both entities lived on other planets, with the father's abode named Planet Kolob, which he shared with another being called the Heavenly Mother, who were parents of Jesus. Mormon cosmology's presumption of an alien god and angels living physically on other planets while shaping the life of humanity for eons has made Mormons the most pro-UFO Christian sect on Earth. Each of the chosen of Smith's flock were to be promised the status of godhood for eternity, living in space like Olympian deities, enjoying procreation, food, and partying like it was Athens 500 BC. However, this privilege was to be reserved only for those who had attained the highest degrees of initiation in Smith's new church, which he created along with an array of new Masonic lodges in Nofu, Illinois. To this day, the Mormon Church has used symbolism taken directly from pagan mystery religions, including the inverted pentagram, 
and the all-seeing eye of Horus featured in the window of the East Central Tower of the Salt Lake City Mormon Temple headquarters. Recall Horus is the Egyptian analog to the god of light, the other primary analog gods being Apollo, Marduk, and Lucifer. In 1888, after several decades of claiming to be a medium that could communicate with the dead, Margareta Fox confessed that their ghost wrappings were a hoax and publicly demonstrated their method. Despite their confession, the spiritualism movement continued to grow in popularity. Historian Bernice Glatzer Rosenthal described this movement in the following terms. The spiritualism doctrine achieved tremendous popularity among people of all classes, including the highest circles of the royal courts of England, Germany, and Russia, because it responded to people's unmet spiritual needs. Born in 1848 near Rochester, New York, the center of the burned-over district, spiritualism achieved its greatest impact in England, home of the Industrial Revolution and of Charles Darwin, Darwin's theory of evolution evoked tremendous religious anxiety because it seemed to contradict the biblical accounts of creation, deny personal immortality, and reduce humankind to a species in the animal kingdom, condemned to an endless struggle for survival. Spiritualism comforted people. It did not require them to renounce Christianity. It used scientific language and methodology to prove its claims, and it accommodated a wide range of views. It also fostered interest in parapsychology. Thus, the fad of seances would emerge out of the spiritualist movement. Spiritualism had the most adherents, but theosophy would have the greater influence on art and thought. Theosophy, the movement Madame Blavatsky founded, would spawn the age of gurus and spiritual sects which in the course of the century evolved into the New Age. Due to the many frauds that began to be exposed by such self-proclaimed mediums such as Blavatsky, the British Society for Psychical Research was formed to investigate paranormal activity using a scientific method. Founded in 1882 in London, the Society for Psychical Research became an influential body, including among its prominent members John Ruskin, Lord Tennyson, W. E. Gladstone, the famed psychologist William James, considered the father of American psychology, Frank Podmore, a founding member of the Fabian Society, and Alfred Russell Wallace, T. H. Huxley's close associate and co-creator of Darwinism, who was also a theosophist forming a rather strange union with Darwinism and Spiritualism. The significance of William James, the father of American psychology and the scientific investigation of the paranormal, should not be lost in its significance. William James is the son of Henry James Sr., who was an independently wealthy Swedenborgian theologian. Thomas Lake Harris, a leader of a series of communal religious experiments culminating in the group called the Brotherhood of the New Life, established in the mid-1850s his own Swedenborgian church in New York, which included Henry James as part of his congregation, as well as Horace Greeley, a utopian socialist who happened to also be a patron of the Fox sisters. Harris, through his new church, explained that Swedenborg had given only the celestial meaning of the scriptures. Harris would now provide their deeper spiritual interpretation. It was both Emanuel Swedenborg and Franz Anton Mesmer who were candidates in the race to find the key to everything. Emanuel Swedenborg was a Swedish pluralistic Christian theologian, scientist, philosopher, and mystic. Swedenborg would attempt to locate the human soul and to prove its immortality. In 1743, he would experience a major religious crisis which began a series of dreams. He is best known for his book On the Afterlife, Heaven and Hell, published in 758, where he claimed to have traveled to both heaven and hell multiple times and communicated with spirits, angels, and even God himself, as well as travels to other planets. 
A hugely industrious man, he established Sweden's first scientific journal and anticipated a number of modern inventions, including prototype submarines and airplanes. In 1716, the science journal Daedalus Hyperboreus published a diagram of a round-winged flying machine designed by the transcendental traveler Swedenborg. This may be the first recorded design of a flying saucer. This is not to say that Swedenborg actually built such a machine, but rather it is to point out the fact that this self-professed interplanetary traveler, who was largely regarded as the father of the spiritualist and theosophist movements, would also create what would become the symbol for UFOs, which was at the center of its mythology and lore. Thus, William James, who grew up with the heavy influences of Thomas Lake Harris's Swedenborgian church, would create a science in the field of psychology on the subjects of hypnotism, revelation through dreams, and trances. Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, would create a science around the interpretation of dreams published in 1899. Freud found that patients' dreams could be fruitfully analyzed to reveal the complex structuring of unconscious material and to demonstrate the psychic action of repression, which he had concluded underlay symptom formation. Freud would make his revelations in his science of dream interpretation during a period where he himself was suffering from disturbing dreams and extreme depression. His work on the interpretation of dreams would act as a sort of manual for how to interpret symbology in the dream state. By 1896, he was using the term psychoanalysis to refer to his new clinical method and the theories on which it was based. Carl Jung, a disciple of Freud, who would become the inheritor of the psychoanalytical movement and popularized its use in the Christian Western world, would also make influential contributions in dream analysis and symbolization, and add it to Freud's theories of how the unconscious influenced the conscious. In 1958, Carl Jung would publish his book titled Flying Saucers, A Modern Myth of Things Seen in the Skies which analyzed the archetypal meaning and possible psychological significance of the reported observations of UFOs. The apocalyptic horror of the Second World War had left many people feeling that God had abandoned humankind and left us to our own vicious devices, that we had entered a new era in which technology had replaced morality as the new religion, and there could be no higher power than the atom bomb. If the round, shining objects that appear in the sky be regarded as visions, we can hardly avoid interpreting them as archetypal images. They would then be involuntary, automatic projections based on instinct, and as little as any other psychic manifestations or symptoms can they be dismissed as meaningless and merely fortuitous. Anyone with the requisite historical and psychological knowledge knows that circular symbols have played an important role in every age. In our own sphere of culture, for instance, they were not only soul symbols, but God images. There is an old saying that God is a circle whose center is everywhere and the circumference nowhere. God in his omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence is a totality symbol par excellence, something round, complete, and perfect. Epiphanies of this sort are, in the tradition, often associated with fire and light. On the antique level, therefore, the UFOs could easily be conceived as gods. They are impressive manifestations of totality whose simple, round form portrays the archetype of the self, which, as we know from experience, plays the chief role in uniting apparently irreconcilable opposites and is therefore best suited to compensate the split-mindedness of our age. It has a particularly important role to play among the other archetypes in that it is primarily the regulator and orderer of chaotic states, giving the personality the greatest possible unity and wholeness. It creates the image of the divine human personality, the primordial man or anthropos, a Chen Yen, true or whole man, and Elijah, who calls down fire from heaven, rises up to heaven in a fiery chariot and is a forerunner of the Messiah, the dogmatized figure of Christ, as well as of Hida, the virgin one, 
who is another parallel to Elijah. Like him, he wanders over the earth as a human personification of Allah. Carl Jung would also write, The exposition begins with the statement that it is night and dark, a time when normally everyone is asleep and dreaming. As in the previous dream panic breaks out, a number of UFOs appear. Recall the first commentary. We could say that the unity of the self as a superordinate, semi-divine figure has broken up into a plurality. On a mythological level, this would correspond to a plurality of gods, god-men, demons, or souls. In hermetic philosophy, the arcane substance has thousand names, but essentially it consists of the one and only, that is, God. And this principle only becomes pluralized through being split up, multiplication. The alchemists were consciously performing an opus divinum when they sought to free the soul in chains. In other words, to release the demiurge distributed and imprisoned in his own creation and restore him to his original condition of unity. Looked at psychologically, the plurality of the symbol of unity signifies a splitting into many independent units, into a number of selves, the one metaphysical principle representing the idea of monotheism is dissolved into a plurality of subordinate deities. From the standpoint of Christian dogma, such an operation could easily be construed as arch-heresy were it not that this view is contradicted by the unequivocal saying of Christ, ye are gods, and by the equally emphatic idea that we are all God's children, both of which presuppose man's at least potential kinship with God. Several decades earlier, Carl Jung would write his magnum opus, Psychology of the Unconscious, a study of the transformation and symbolisms of the libido, a contribution to the history of the evolution of thought, published in 1912. In his chapter titled Aspects of the Libido, Jung would describe the interaction between the character of Goethe's Faust and the demonic figure of Mephistopheles, to whom he sells his soul in return for Gnostic power and knowledge. In reaction to this dialogue, Jung would write, Here the devil again puts into Faust's hand the marvelous tool, a phallic symbol of the libido, as once before in the beginning the devil, in the form of the black dog, accompanied Faust when he introduced himself with the words, Part of that power not understood, which always wills the bad and always creates the good. United to this strength, Faust succeeded in accomplishing his real-life task, at first through evil adventure, and then for the benefit of humanity. For without the evil, there is no creative power. Apollo has always been associated with the light of the sun, giver or bringer of light. According to the mythologies of Apollo, he is not only known as the god of music and the arts and other good works, he also has a dark side and is known as the god of distance, death, terror, and awe. Since Apollo is equated as the light of the sun, those who follow his cult have also been referenced as sun worshippers and children of the sun. Johann Jacob Bakofen's works were extremely influential upon the modern children of the sun. His theory of cultural evolution in his 1861 work Das Mütterich was described as four phases. One, wild nomadic phase, the proto-Aphrodite. 
2. Matriarchal Lunar Phase, the Early Demeter 3. Transitional Phase, the Original Dionysus and 4. The Patriarchal Solar Phase, called the Apollonian in which all trace of the matriarchal and Dionysian past are eradicated and modern civilization emerges. Bakufen's cultural evolution theory greatly influenced Otto Gross, the first disciple of Freud, and Carl Jung's work, which was very much focused on this Aryan sun-worshipping religion to which he wrote Psychology of the Unconscious. Lucifer is also known as the Morning Star, and in Greek is referred to as Piosphoros, meaning bringer of light, before his fall from heaven. In the Bible, Apollyon is the Greek synonym for Satan. Prominent theosophist Alice Bailey, founder of Lucius Trust, a major player within the United Nations, was heavily influenced by Madame Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine and would write in her Esoteric Psychology, Volume 2, A Treatise on the Seven Rays, published in 1942, about the mystery of the descent of fall to earth of the rebellious angels. These solar angels are Agnishvatas, to which Lucifer is the best-known representative. In Alice Bailey's Rays and the Initiations, she writes that we must add darkness unto light so that the stars appear, for in the light the stars shine not, but in the darkness light diffused is not, but only focused points of radiance. Thus, according to Bailey, we must bring forth the darkness. From this we see a clear trajectory of the Apollonian mystery religion from ancient Babylon, Egypt, and Greece to our modern day and age, the dawn of a new age. With Jung's direct observance of the useful role UFOs can play as the new gods of our new technological era, one must ask themselves the question, whose religion are we to become followers of? In our next episode, we will explore this question in further detail by introducing Thomas Huxley's disciple, H.G. Wells, who oversaw a grand strategy to bring about this new age of mankind, including a revival of an ancient pantheon of new deities managed by a modern priesthood, starting with a book called The War of the Worlds. Thank you.